When stuck between the choice of traveling across a country or earning money, a working holiday might be the answer that allows an individual to do both. It was this notion, working while seeing various cities and sites, that drew in Anthony John Jones. Better known as Tony, the 20-year-old was a native of Perth, Western Australia, and planned to spend six months traveling on a working holiday. He was due to return home just after he mysteriously vanished in 1982. Prior to his disappearance, Tony had spent time in Adelaide, Melbourne, Canberra, and Sydney. While these trips were mostly brief, he did spend several months in Brisbane before he and his brother Tim decided it was time to start heading home. For three weeks, the 20-year-old hitchhiked while his brother traveled by bicycle, and they kept in contact by phoning relatives and leaving messages for one another. While on their way to Townsville, Queensland, the pair stopped at Mackay and Airly Beach. When they reached Townsville, they spent a week together in a caravan with two other travelers. Once more deciding that it was time to move, Tim began the 559-mile trek to Mount Isa, while Tony opted to set off alone on October 28th for a trip to the Cairns. He arrived back in Townsville six days later, on November 3rd, where he called his family and girlfriend back home. By this time, Tim had already reached Mount Isa, while their mother informed Tony that she had sent the pair $150 to split between them. This was the last time that Tony was heard from. After this point, his calls ceased, his bank account was left untouched, and he never reached Mount Isa, where his brother was waiting. After waiting for a few days, Tim realized something must be wrong. Back in Perth, the rest of the family grew concerned, as they hadn't heard from the 20-year-old, and neither had his girlfriend. Despite their growing alarm, the family waited eight days after their last phone call with him to report him missing. They hoped that he was simply having trouble finding someone to give him a lift to Mount Isa, but it soon became apparent that this wasn't the issue. It is believed that Tony went missing on the Flinders Highway, which is about 487 miles long and runs from Townsville to Cloncurry. The remote road, which connects the outback to Queensland, is said to have a disturbing reputation. Eleven individuals disappeared from or were murdered along the highway between 1970 and 2018. Isolated and barren, former Queensland detective Jim Slade stated that the area was a place of opportunity for someone wishing to cause harm to another. Further fueling the eerie notoriety of Flanders Highway is Dr. Susanna Fay, a University of Queensland expert in place-based crime, who stated, quote, The 70s and 80s is the highest point of Australian violent crime, and I do think that we continue to come back to this kind of crime of opportunity. You do have these tight-knit communities, so it's very possible that people will see things, but because outsiders coming through is somewhat normal, they may not even realize what they've seen. Much of the investigation into Tony's disappearance is messy, and the case has gained a reputation as one of Australia's most high-profile missing persons cases due to the fact it was horrendously mishandled by the Queensland police. Reportedly, many of the police force's recruits were later charged with or tried for corruption. According to news.com.au, it is emblematic of the Queensland police culture during the 1980s, which the Fitzgerald Inquiry found to be debilitated by misconduct, inefficiency, incompetence, and deficient leadership. The Fitzgerald Inquiry involved an investigation into police corruption and misconduct in Queensland. The biggest lead in the case appeared in January of 1983, just months after Tony was last heard from, when investigators received an anonymous letter in which the writer claimed to know the whereabouts of the 20-year-old's remains. The envelope bore a Cairns postmark, a location Tony had visited in the days before he vanished, and simply read, I believe body of A.J. Jones buried in or near Fullerton Riverbed within 100 yards south side Flinders Highway, Lodgeal. The chilling letter prompted detectives to order a search of the area described, with this exploration taking two whole days. But in the end, they found nobody and dismissed the note as an unpleasant hoax. Inquest documents would later reveal that in the weeks leading up to the search, the dry riverbed was filled with about 20 feet of water, 
which meant there was not much hope of finding any trace of Tony or his possessions. Tony's family, for their part, did not believe the letter was deceptive and began urging the police to pull DNA from it which could help identify the killer, or at least a strong witness. However, the police repeatedly declined to do so. It wasn't until 2007 that the authorities revealed the letter had been misplaced in the years following its arrival at the police station. Another horrendously botched piece of evidence came from a witness who told the police that he had joined Tony along with an older man at the Rising Sun Hotel in Townsville. The older man had reportedly picked the 20-year-old up earlier in the day and suggested they head to the pub for a meal before visiting Charters Towers. The witness engaged in light conversation with the two who revealed their plans. As far as we know, providing this witness was correct in identifying Tony, this was the last time the young man was seen alive. The witness described the older man to a police sketch artist and was able to provide details about the man's vehicle, along with identifying scars on his arms. But it wasn't until 1992, an entire decade after Tony's disappearance, that the sketch of this man was made public. It is believed that the police delayed revealing the image to the public because the older man described bore a striking resemblance to one of the police's own retired officers. After the image was published on November 2nd, 1992, law enforcement was flooded with calls that claimed the image matched that of a former policeman named Mervyn Henry Stevenson. The arm scars described were a good match to those Stevenson had, and his vehicle was very similar to the one described in the Identicut. At the time of Tony's disappearance, Stevenson had recently retired from the force. He was seen to be a clean and decorated officer who had started in Cohn, a coastal town that, as of 2016, has a population of just 364 people, and eventually he worked his way through the ranks to become a superintendent in charge of the Townsville Police District. However, a few years after he retired, his reputation was reduced to rubble when corruption charges were laid against him. A police report alleged Stevenson of being involved in cattle stealing failing to investigate a slew of drug-related offenses, and also declining to examine the dubious suicide of another officer. However, Stevenson was never investigated for any of these charges because Police Commissioner Terry Lewis refused to approve the Inquisition. Notably, Lewis was later charged with 23 counts of perjury, corruption, and forgery. He was stripped of his previously bestowed knighthood and given 14 years behind bars. Stevenson, meanwhile, died in 2001. 30 years after Tony's disappearance, in early 2002, the results of a long-delayed coroner's inquest were revealed. It was found that despite no body being recovered, the 20-year-old was a victim of homicide. His death certificate was eventually issued in 2006. In 2007, Tony's family reviewed the inquest documents and discovered that numerous major leads were ignored by investigators back in the 1980s. Numerous witnesses who came forward in 1982 were never interviewed until 2001, while much of the case's statements and evidence were either dismissed or missing altogether. Furthermore, the investigation didn't even start until three days after the 20-year-old was reported missing. It was also revealed that somehow, Tony's dental records were lost, and the police declined to collect a report from the hospital about the treatment the young man had received shortly before he vanished. Officers also failed to assist the family in searching the area around the phone booth where Tony had last called from. The family took it upon themselves to go door to door to conduct inquiries. Obviously distressed by all this information, Tony's family petitioned the Queensland Attorney General to reopen the investigation, but their requests were continuously disregarded until 2010. During this year, Tony and Tim's other brother, Brian, sent the Attorney General a pair of the 20-year-old's shoes with a note that asked him to walk a day in the shoes of a victim of Queensland crime. After a campaign with the theme of Walk a Day in My Shoes was launched, the inquest was reopened the following day. In 2011, it was discovered that even more evidence had been neglected by the authorities. The family were told by a grazier that in 1982, he had handed over evidence to investigators when he came across a campsite in Cloncurry. Along with a friend who was a retired police officer, 
the grazier found what was left of some camping gear, and among it, a letter addressed to Tony, signed by the 20-year-old's mother. Despite the fact this evidence was incredibly important, it seemed to simply languish in the hold of the police until it was eventually lost or destroyed. After the family were told about this evidence, they insisted that a thorough investigation of the area where it was found was carried out. The search occurred, but only after nine more months had passed. It took place on October 11th and involved eight police officers and four state emergency service workers, all of whom spent six hours combing through the area. Unsurprisingly, given the passage of time, there was nothing left of Tony's belongings. A few days following the search, a former inmate came forward and revealed that his old cellmate, Michael Laundress, had admitted to the slaying of a young man 18 years after Tony's disappearance. The former inmate didn't make the connection to Tony right away, given that almost two decades had passed since the crime. It wasn't until the inquest was reopened that he realized Tony's disappearance may have been the one his cellmate was talking about. Laundress reportedly stated, I did a bloke in, out near Mount Isa. He was hitchhiking at the time, and I buried him out there. Frustratingly, due to repeated delays, stalls in the inquest, and the replacement of the coroner during the middle of it all, Laundress died in October of 2015, having never made a statement. At some point during the inquest, a tip-off was received by the police that a person of interest in the case had given away a rifle, which appeared to be the same as the dismantled one Tony had been carrying, at the time of his disappearance. However, investigators delayed interviewing the witness for many months. Reportedly, when they finally did speak with this witness, authorities showed him an image of the wrong gun and dismissed the line of inquiry when the individual couldn't identify it. The weapon is described as a 22 caliber rifle with a dark red stained stock and serial number 257435. In December of 1982, the town of Huendon became a place of interest when around five individuals alleged that between the 12th and 14th of November, they interacted with and spoke with a young male hitchhiker who resembled Tony. Following this reveal, investigators spoke with locals and collected statements where they discovered differing accounts from witnesses. One described the young man as being of Aboriginal descent, while another called him an Italian tourist. The other remaining statements referred to a man with a full beard. One witness in particular recalled speaking with Tony at around 8 p.m. on November 12th and noted he had what she called an Abraham Lincoln style beard. This lead subsequently fell through as Tony had recently shaved off his beard in the days before his disappearance. Additionally, he had not used his bank accounts or called his girlfriend or family. This indicated that something untoward had happened to him on or around November 3rd. In a separate news report, further witnesses later emerged who claimed that they all knew of one individual, though some reports say it was two men, who had confessed to the murder of a hitchhiker in Huendon. The timeline for this alleged slaying lines up as Tony would have been passing through the town at the time. There are allegations that Tony's body was disposed of in a slaughter yard following his death. In July of 2017, the coroner ruled that there was insufficient evidence for a search of the slaughterhouse to be carried out using ground-penetrating radar, much to the family's disappointment. In February of 2016, during the lead-up to the new inquest, it was confirmed that Mervyn Stevenson, the retired police officer believed to have been seen with Tony during his last days, would be named a suspect. A secondary artist sketch was created by Townsville Bulletin artist Chris Brunton in the 1990s, which attracted several more leads. These leads had not been investigated by the time of the 2002 inquest, and the coroner encouraged the authorities to look into them, particularly in relation to two individuals who were named persons of interest. The individuals went by Pickering and Douglas. However, it took seven years before the police acted on these instructions. By this time, both men were dead. Another suspect arose several years after the first few did, in 1999, when an internal police memo obtained by the family noted, quote, I have also received a letter from a retired grazier who was named a suspect by the name of blank, and I note that his history indicates that he is most probably a blank, and I consider that he should be interviewed. 
I have attached a copy of the letter. However, neither the Grazier's letter nor any further details pertaining to this line of inquiry were revealed or discussed at the 2002 inquest, nor were they made available to the family. Ivan Millett, an Australian serial killer known for the backpacker murders in which he killed two men and five women between 1989 and 1992, was initially considered a person of interest but was ruled out of the investigation in 2016. In the years since, the family has continued to be stonewalled and face infuriating hurdles that bring the case to a standstill time and time again. Many witnesses with information have started to bypass the police altogether and directly contact the family. Another of Tony's brothers, Mark, told news.com.au, Detective Sergeant Brendan Stevenson has become so hostile towards the family that he has sought legal advice about possible action against the family for criticisms made during the inquest, as well as to find legal reasons not to keep the family updated as to any progress with the investigations. At the time of the recording of this video, the most recent update in Tony's case comes from Nine Now, which appears to be the only news outlet reporting on allegations that the 20-year-old was killed in a pub brawl. Three women have come forward with the story, but the men who are reportedly involved have denied any involvement in Tony's disappearance. Tony's mysterious vanishing in 1982 is described as the catalyst for the establishment of Australia's National Missing Persons Week in 1988. Every year, it aims to shed light on the tragedy and the horror of missing people and the ones they leave behind. In 2008, Tony's photograph and information were included on a pack of cold case playing cards, which were distributed to inmates at numerous Queensland prisons. However, the cards failed to bring closure to the case. Tony's case is still unsolved. He was last seen and heard from in Townsville, Queensland on November 3rd, 1982. He is described as a white male with green eyes and brown hair. He is around five foot seven in height and had a slim build at the time of his disappearance. If you have any information about his case, you can contact Crime Stoppers Australia at 1800 treble three treble zero. And there you have the facts. Please leave a comment down below with your own thoughts and speculations. And remember to like this video and subscribe to support the channel. Thank you for watching. Stay alert, stay safe, and I'll see you next time.